My name is Richard Freudenberger. I am uh, an author for New Society Publishers, and that's the Alcohol Field Book. And I'm also uh, one of the staff people of Back Home Magazine. And Back Home Magazine uh, is a magazine that was started in 1990 um, by some of the original staffers of, of uh, this event's Mother Earth News. So I operated the, um, I was an editor there at, at Mother Earth, and I operated the uh, research facility we had from uh, about 1980 to about uh, 1990. Uh, and we did a lot of work in, in small-scale manufacture of alcohol fuel in the, in the late 70s and early, and early 80s. This is not a discussion about mixing alcohol with gasoline. And for the most part, we're talking about straight alcohol fuel, just manufacturing alcohol fuel from farm and food waste and, um, and distilling it, fermenting it, distilling it, and, and making it suitable for fuel in a, in a motor vehicle. So. Uh, how many people out here have an agricultural background, like uh, maybe a farming or some kind of small scale farm? And how many people just have an idea they might want to do this in a more of a suburban or cooperative venture? No? Okay. Um, it, it is something that can be done on almost any scale. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, economics. Uh, certain, if, it's, if it's too small, it is not always as feasible economically. Uh, as it could be if it was larger, but if it's, if it's too large, it's also a big investment. So what I'm gonna go through is basically some reasons why we would like to, why we think about making alcohol fuel, and, um, and then we can talk about some of the equipment and the uh, feedstocks, the crops and things it takes to, uh, to manufacture it. And, and we'll uh, talk a little bit about engines and modifications and things like that. So what I wanna do is, is uh, start the discussion and talk about why we even want to make alcohol fuel. Well, the alcohol is actually ethanol. It's the same, the same thing as, as grain alcohol or, uh, or um, Everclear, uh, I guess they call it. Uh, it's a distilled, a distilled product uh, made from, it can be made from anything with starch or sugar in it. So whether it's apples and sugar cane or oranges or grapefruit or any other sugar-based crop, grapes, um, any number of sugar-based crops, or we can switch over to think about potatoes or corn, barley, rye, um, the starch-based crops, or the, a crop like, uh, like uh, sorghum, a sweet sorghum, the sugar-based crop, which is an excellent source for this, for this area. Uh, is, it's a fairly high yield uh, for for a crop, it, 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 can, it can create a lot of alcohol from a, from a relatively small amount of, uh, of crop. So that's a real, good, a real good choice, as is sugarcane. That's another real good choice, but unfortunately, sugarcane isn't something that grows in temperate zones as easily. It really takes more of a tropical, uh, tropical um, area to grow. Uh, Florida will grow it, Louisiana grows it, uh, obviously Brazil grows it because we, uh, we, that's, they are probably the the initiators of the modern alcohol fuel movement is the, the country of Brazil where they, where they had to use alcohol fuel because they were, they were drowning in debt uh, due to their OPEC uh, indebtedness of their petroleum purchases from, uh, from the oil bearing countries. So in 1975, they initiated a, a program where the entire country would be switched over to running on alcohol made from their own sugar cane. Um, and that's when I, when I started to get into it, right after, right after that happened. Um, so it's a renewable fuel. It, it comes from a source that either you grow it or you can, you can source it from a product that has been discarded. Uh, I, depending on what sources you read, the um, amount of food we throw away in this country is anywhere from 33 to about 40% of the total food produced we throw out. If we, if we can salvage that before it spoils and turn it into alcohol, we have a huge resource of, of fuel that um, above and beyond gasoline. I mean, I mean just, a, just a, a liquid fuel, that, that's the whole point. It's very, very difficult to find a fuel that works in an automobile that has enough density and energy density to be able to carry it along in the vehicle with you. Um, you know, it'll, it'll work, other fuels work well at stationary sites 
in furnaces or in uh, machines that operate without moving on wheels, but uh, it's, it's difficult to get a liquid that actually works that well and is renewable as well, and alcohol is, alcohol is one of those. Um, it's, it's storable, it can be easily handled with existing equipment, there's very few modifications they do to, uh, to be able to store the alcohol in tanks, uh, not only in the car but in the, uh, in the ground, you know, in, in, the, in the pump tank. Um, it doesn't require any special infrastructure or equipment. Uh, it does require specific equipment, but it's not really special equipment. It's very easily manufactured. Um, it's not like uh, hydrogen or some of the other uh, fuel products that are being suggested because that requires an entirely new infrastructure. We, we already have the pumps and the tanks and the fuel stations and the, um, and the uh, garages where we can do conversions and all that. So it's really not not a difficult uh, step into an alcohol fuel uh, society. Um, and it can be made from any starch or sugar. Uh, the, the, the only difference is some, some crops and some food, some uh, uh, materials are just yield more alcohol per ton or per acre than others. So the obvious point is to try to choose something that grows in your area that um, will produce the highest amount of yield as possible and also ideally not one that's not um, a food although that's sort of difficult I mean, you, you're, and I'll discuss food versus fuel towards the end of the discussion but uh, but if there is a source of uh, material that you can grow that like Jerusalem artichokes for example that's, that's something that really is not a common food item but it is an excellent source of alcohol fuel if you if you want to use it uh, so it's um, it's a it's a manufacturing process that will work with almost any crop I can think of. Um, uh, and also can be made from waste, from industrial waste in the food industry. Sugar products like bakery products, beverage products like, like uh, soft drinks, um, any number of um, corn-based uh, syrups and, and things like that that they use in normal food manufacturing. If there's any waste at all, that can be converted to alcohol. Uh, quite easily, it's already it's already halfway there, um, uh, and it's also a domestic fuel. It's, it's it's people sort of let that go over their heads off, and it's, this is something we can grow right here in the U.S. and make right here in the U.S. and serve service right here in the U.S. Uh, whether it's on a national level or or a very local level, it's it's still doable, and it doesn't have to be a southern tier region. It could be up you know up north. Crops work just fine in Minnesota. And, Wisconsin and Texas and, and Oregon and any other place. Uh, so it's just a matter of what grows best in what, in what region. Um, and it also works in just about any uh, gasoline engine manufactured and it actually can be used um, in diesel engines to a limited amount. It, uh, diesel engines don't run uh, on 100% ethanol but they, uh, they can run on about 30% ethanol if it's injected, if it's entrained into the uh, into the intake air intake, so it gets mixed in with the air before it gets sent to the combustion chamber of the engine. Now, um, a company in Sweden has actually manufactured, in partnered with some other people, uh, and manufactured a um, a vehicle which I think was a Saab uh, or a Volvo. I, I forget, but anyway, they have. Um, I have a pic I think I have a picture over here that they actually have a 95 percent alcohol powered diesel engine and they have been operating that. It's not for sale, it's just a test vehicle. Uh, but they were doing this just to, just to test the market for construction equipment and some other stuff. Um, alcohol or ethanol is a very, very, very clean fuel. It is clean because it, it has oxygen in its molecular structure. It already has oxygen built in so it burns very cleanly. Um, uh, it's it's really just a uh, and, and every and every measure of in every every one of the EPA testing cycles and measurement it burns more way more clean than gasoline, with the exception of nitrous oxides, which in which case it's not that in some tests it has run lower and some tests it has run higher, but it's a, that's the only area that it's a, a bit of a uh, a bit of a difference. Everything else it's it's a very much more clean burning fuel and it's a cooler burning fuel in the engine, so it actually is a is a, uh, a better choice that way. We, uh, there are tests done, there were tests done at uh, Baylor University in Texas for aviation fuel on alcohol, um, and they actually have instruments that measure the combustion chamber 
temperatures, the manifold temperatures, uh, all the other parts of the engine that are critical, and the uh, at the operating at the operating speed of that the aircraft would normally operate, the the temperatures were anywhere from 50 degrees cooler to to uh, up to about 190 degrees cooler. So uh, that's a, a good thing, actually, for the longevity of the engine. Um, and if it's produced carefully, if it's produced correctly with the with the right equipment and sourced from the right um, materials, it can easily be manufactured uh, at a cost competitive level with gasoline or, or below. Um, when, when, when the price of gasoline gets up about four dollars, four dollars and twenty cents, it's, it's very easy to make alcohol for that much. When it's down at three dollars or less, then, then it's a little more difficult. But in any case, another way to look at it is that there, we are not making Gasoline is not going to last forever. We, we do not have an infinite supply of petroleum to be able to source our gasoline for, the, you know, for centuries ahead. So we have to be thinking about a transition fuel like this to sort of get our toe in the water as far as, um, as, far as uh, getting a fuel that works and, and one that people feel comfortable with. Uh, when I was in Brazil, I, I worked with Volkswagen uh, for a little bit and uh, the uh, Brazilian Air Force was demonstrated an aircraft for me that was a uh, propeller driven reciprocal engine airplane, not, not a jet, but a piston aircraft. And Mercedes had some experiments going, and uh, Fiat, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, Volkswagen. Uh, everybody was running an alcohol model and had it for sale and without any major problems at all. And in fact, the same engine that was made in Detroit for Pontiac was manufactured in Sao Paulo, Brazil for the GM of Brazil, it's the same engine and they were running on alcohol. Why couldn't we do that? Well, you know, we didn't. Um, uh, they, they never really quite explained all that, but the engineers down there said, no, we, we went to school up in your country, that's where we learned, and then we came back down here. <laughs> so, it, why they didn't do that, I don't know, but, um, but the economy of Brazil was, 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 it was critical that they get onto a fuel that was not gasoline and diesel. Um, and they man and they managed to do that. Even today, they have they use uh, they, they still use gasoline, but they have a, a high content of alcohol, a high uh, a high use of uh, of uh, compressed natural gas, and they also have gasoline too. So you can make your choice. And I'll I'll show you a picture of a vehicle that uh, runs on all three. Okay. Well, I've been I've been using the words ethanol and alcohol. Uh, interchangeably, and that's, that's true. Ethanol is ethyl alcohol. As I said, it was the same stuff that Everclear is. It's actually a, it's actually a, um, a consumable alcohol product that's manufactured from starches and sugars. Uh, it's the same as Jack Daniels. It's the same as um, you know, any bourbon, any liquor, any, uh, any uh, of the still spirits. It's just a lot stronger. Uh, and it doesn't have the flavoring in it. We don't care about the taste of it. It's just, it's just the, the uh, uh, alcohol content, um, and we use grain products or starches to make it. And I've explained that before, um, and we also um, you can also use this is this is a this is a fairly emerging technology, but it is to the point now where they are actually manufacturing alcohol from from wood, wood chips, wood waste. It's called cellulosic alcohol. Cellulose is wood. Um, it takes a it takes a breakdown. It takes a special kind of an enzyme to break down the starches, to break down the wood into a starch, and then break the starch. Then we convert the starch into a sugar. The, the, the alcohol can only be made if it's uh, made from sugar. So if we have a starch product, like a potato, we have to convert those starches to complex sugars, and then we have to convert the complex sugars to simple sugars, and then we can start making alcohol. Um, the, um, Ethanol is the only drinkable alcohol. There is, there is another alcohol called methanol, which pe people may have heard of because it's used as a racing fuel. Um, but methanol is very toxic and it cannot be consumed. Ethanol can be consumed, so the federal government requires that you put 2% uh, gasoline or naphtha or some other product in your alcohol to denature it so you can't drink it, because if you drink it, it will make you sick. So they, they make us put uh, two percent of this non-drinkable stuff in the drinkable alcohol, so you can't drink it. So that's uh, that's the law. Um, ethanol is what they use at the Indianapolis race 
every year when they have Indy 500, that's, uh, they ceased using gasoline because it was too dangerous. I think they stopped it back in 2002 or something like that, and now they use ethanol. They use, they use pure, pure uh, grain alcohol in the cars. So, um, and they don't have any trouble. I'm gonna show you some, I'm show you some pictures now. These are just, I'll go through some, some of these pretty quickly. This is what most people think of. This is like a, a basic home or small business revenue's still. Uh, basically, it's a very simple, very low proof, uh, low alcohol content manufacturing uh, distillery. Um, and what's happening is that big gray tank on your left, or that black tank, is the, uh, is where it's being cooked, and then it's it's going into this first barrel to get uh, to get uh, separated, and then it's getting finally getting separated completely in the coils there on the right side. Uh, but the proof of this, with this distillery, the proof is only down about 80 or 90 proof. 200 proof is 100% alcohol. 100 proof is 50% alcohol. 86 proof liquor is you know not really all that strong. You certainly couldn't use it in, in an engine. A uh, gentleman here before had asked me what the uh, what the minimum proof is for a vehicle. Uh, it's about 160, and the vehicle will run, but not very well. It also will, over time, will damage the uh, damage the carburetor and do some internal damage. So it's not recommended. But when you get up to about 185 proof and higher, uh, which is very doable, in a, even in a small scale operation, uh, it's it's pretty good. It, it, it works very well as fuel. That image that I showed you before. This is just a sort of a sort of a uh, graphic of how that works. You're basically taking a mixture of corn, ground up corn, one bushel of corn takes 28 gallons of water, it gets stirred into a mash, into a slurry, and then heated, and once it reaches a certain temperature, about a, in, in some cases up to 195 degrees or maybe even higher, it has to get boiled depending on the enzyme. You drop the temperature down and, and then we let the enzymes go to work to, to break the starch, in the corn into sugar, and then we put a second enzyme in to break the sugar, the complex sugar, into a simple sugar. And then we can feed that mixture yeast, and the yeast will manufacture CO2, heat, and alcohol. And that's what, what they're doing is consuming, consuming the sugars as food, they're, they're uh, procreating, they're making more of themselves, and they're and then they, they sort of slough off, but in the meantime, well, the product they're making is CO2 and alcohol. We only get about 10% uh, in, a, in a mash run like this, in, this, in that, in that uh, left-hand side tank where it says alcohol steam, only about 10% of that liquid in there is alcohol, the rest of it's water. And the whole concept of, of stripping the water out is called distillation, and we are, we are removing, bit by bit, we're removing the water out of the alcohol, and, what, and all that's left is the alcohol. So that's what we're doing. And that's this is a very simple uh, old-time distillation thing. I, I never even used to talk about this because I, I carried the permit, the federal permit, to manufacture alcohol for, for Mother Earth News. It was sort of my thing. Um, and the federal agent, the, uh, the head of the Revenue Department at, um, out of Atlanta had made it very clear to me that we, we're not going to discuss moonshine in the same discussion as fuel. And this was many years ago. Now with all the home brew stuff going on and the, and the sort of boutique distilleries out there, I don't, I don't feel so uncomfortable. But, but uh, just to make it clear, we're, we're talking about fuel, not, not liquor. So this next image is a fella in, um, in Missouri uh, named West. Mr. West runs a little orchard, a little farm operation on, I don't know, 10 or 12 acres out there. Um, he had built a six inch, the, the column, that black tube going up from the, uh, from the center of that tank is the distillation column. This was based on an old Mother Earth design from 1980. Um, we have since no longer need that little elbow that sticks on the side there. That's not really a necessary component. So basically what's happening is the, is the slurry of, uh, of starch and liquid is boiling in that black tank, which is actually an old propane tank. And, um, it's being driven up, the steam is being, the vapors are being driven up through that, uh, through that central tube. And at the top there, you'll see the, those, um, those uh, little smaller tubes uh, on the left side of that, of that big tube. They are, um, they are actually condensing coils, the feed for the condensing coils and the, and the off feed for the alcohol. So it's a really a very simple operation. This actually is so, is so uh, 
low energy that he's using four electric water heaters to heat it. You can see those little white wires down at the bottom. He's just using hot water heater elements to heat the to heat the tank. So it's a real simple thing. I think he built this for either six or nine hundred dollars. I think what he told me. So it was very doable. This is Mr. John Painter from uh, uh, Wayne County, Pennsylvania. He has a dairy farm up there, and at the time this photo was taken, he was operating a 12-inch um, distillation column for his, uh, his dairy operation. He was running his trucks and such on it. He set aside some acreage, about 80 acres of rye, so he could grow the, grow the feedstock. And uh, then he would run, run it, he would use corn and, and rye, depending on what season it was, and he would run his uh, operation, he'd run his mash through the distillation column and store the, store the alcohol for future use in his, in his equipment. So he had a real good situation because he's manufacturing it, He's using it for heat in the in the milking barns, and he's um, and he's using it in his vehicle. So you know it was all very self-contained, a very a very good uh, situation. This is a the federal form, uh, 5110-74. It's the it's the alcohol fuel request form, so you can get your permit. Um, people often say, well, you know, I just do it without that. Now people, you can certainly do that. You, uh, you risk. It's a very high risk uh, effort if you do it without a permit, if you get caught. Um, so I would highly recommend if anybody's serious about it. They, it, it doesn't cost anything. They, they normally don't turn people down. Uh, they don't really come out to inspect anything. They don't, they're not gonna be bothering you. They have the right to come out and inspect. Um, and they may show up at any time, but they, they normally don't. You know, we used to get inspected occasionally only because we had such a uh, out there operation in publishing the magazine and all, it was pretty obvious. So they just they would check up us, make sure we kept our records, and that's really all they ask is that you keep is that you keep records, uh, keep accurate records, so they, they know how much went into it and how much came out of it, because they can tell just by knowing those two factors how much, if you don't have enough product in your tank and you don't have proof that you know they used it in the vehicles, they know it went somewhere, and that's what they don't want because they make uh, a lot of money on the revenue from the sale of alcohol, so they don't want you selling it off on the side. So uh, they, will, they will keep up with you on that, but they may not necessarily pay you a visit. So the, the process is really you know, pretty simple. It, it, you take your, your starch product and you mill it or grind it with a milling machine or a uh, hammer mill or some type of a grinding uh, operation. And a lot of agricultural equipment uses that same technique, so it's not difficult. Um, and then it has to be cooked. And the temperature at which it has to be cooked is purely dependent on the uh, product you're using, whether it's a say corn as opposed to potatoes, as opposed to uh, uh, a rye or something like that. Uh, the water content of the feedstock will determine how much water you have to add to how many pounds or bushels of product you're using, so everything is a little different. The book has, has charts in there about what it takes for each, each crop, but, uh, but essentially you're mixing water with your crop, you're heating, you're grinding, you're, you ground up your crop, you're heating it, and you're basically that first step, the heating it is the first step of breaking down that starch wall and breaking that stuff down so that the enzymes can have an easier job of working it. Then we put in the enzyme, the, that was called the alpha enzyme, the first enzyme, and that breaks the starch down into a, a more manageable unit. And then we introduce a, um, a second enzyme called the beta enzyme or the B enzyme, and that will break down the, uh, the already broken down starch and into the sugars and the, the, fine, the, the uh, uh, simple sugar we need to make the alcohol because the alcohol does not work directly from the starch. It has to be turned into sugar first. Uh, once the, once the uh, sugar content is in there, the uh, yeast is added and the yeast will feed off the sugar because that's the food. That's the, sugar, that's the yeast's food. Uh, it will feed off the sugar and manufacture, as I said before, carbon dioxide and alcohol. And a little bit of heat, too, because it'll, it'll generate its own heat because they're working. They're eating, they're procreating, and they're just, they're just cranking. It takes about three days to, uh, to get all this process done. And then at the end of those three days, you'll have a tub of liquid that is essentially uh, about anywhere from about 8% alcohol at the, at the lowest end. If it's, lower, if it's lower than that, something's wrong. But you're, you're at, at the lowest end, about 8% alcohol, at the highest, and you have to have special 
uh, yeast to make this happen, but at the highest, you, you can actually manufacture a mash that is about 21% alcohol, which is excellent, but uh, normally it's going to be about 10, 12, 14%. Then we have to run the... Oh, this is a this picture is just the mash being mixed up. It's just corn here uh, being stirred up in that, in that stainless steel tank, and the water is being added in increments to get it to get it thinned out a little bit. That's Mr. Painter's operation there. The yeast cycle is just, it's, it's in the book here. I, I just explained how it worked. It just, it goes through and just manufactures carbon dioxide and uh, CO2 and alcohol and a little bit of heat. And this is an example of some of the alp, apple pulp. Uh, people who don't use corn make, back in orchard may use apple uh, pulping and they pulp it up and that could be a good feedstock because it already has, it's already a sugar. The trouble with the sugar is the starches take enzymes which cost which are an expense, and it takes some time and some process to get that starch turned into a sugar. If we start with sugar, the drawback is time, because we don't want that stuff to, sugar will spoil in the open air very quickly, so we have a very narrow window to be able to transport the sugar, the apples from where, you, where you've got them to where you want to use them without them spoiling, especially once they're ground up. So, so we have a pretty narrow window that the starch can store for, for several months at a time. So that's, you know, that's the good side of the starch. And the, the bad side of the starch is it takes several steps in the process. Sugar doesn't last very long, but it's a very simple process. The enzymes, as I said, are a bit of an expense. The better the enzyme, the more expensive they are. Uh, there's only a very few manufacturers of enzymes in the, in the world, so uh, they sort of have a corner on the market. But we don't really need, we don't absolutely need to buy enzymes from people. We can use six row barley, which is how they normally made scotch and bourbon and all, you know, in the, in, in the day where they still do it. Um, six row barley is, a, is, a, is a, a certain species of barley that actually produces a fairly high enzyme content in its, in its uh, manufacture, so we can, if we, if we add the barley mix to the, to the mash, we are actually introducing a, an enzyme that will, it's a natural enzyme that will work. It's not, it's not as effective as the, as the store-bought stuff, but it, it does work. So if someone was interested in doing a totally self-contained and owner-grown operation, that's the way to do it. These are just some manufactured, um, or some, some of the components of, uh, of the tank, the tanking and the uh, distillation column I'll show you a little later. Um, this is just a large tank with the heating and cooling coil in the center of it that you could actually heat the mash by passing uh, either steam. We normally wouldn't do that uh, on a home scale, but in the industry they pass steam through the coils, but we can just put, put very hot water through there and it will eventually heat the uh, liquid in the tank. Uh, and then when we need cooling, you can turn the hot water off and put the cold water in and it'll, it'll bring down the temperature. We need it to come from like 180 degrees down to about 95 in some cases uh, for the yeast to work correctly. So, um, so we can use the same tank for both cooking and cooling. And another tank is another design that actually uses a jet of uh, a high speed, high volume pump that actually stirs the, uh, that tank has a, it doesn't show it, but actually it's a circular stirring motion and it, it, it stirs the mash up very thoroughly by just the jet of water like a jacuzzi. And it spins it around in there and makes it suitable before uh, we put the enzymes in it. These are the, the, again, the painter's operation. He has one tank for every day of the week, so he's, every day he's pulling off. Um, so when he starts, you know, Sundays, then, uh, then he's pulling off Saturdays for, and then, you know, the whole thing just cycles through. So every Every day you can pull off one load of mash and put it in the fermenter. Um, and a picture of his fermenters. These are a couple of designs. These are more, these are more commercial designs. Uh, they're plates. These, these columns are generally anywhere from four, 28 to up to 40 plus feet tall, depending on you know, how, how big your operation is. And at every level there's a plate with, with holes in it and a little, little, I think I may have a picture of little holes in it, and the vapors come up, and as, as it passes through the plate, the water drops out. A little of alcohol goes to the next plate. A little more water comes out. The alcohol goes to the next plate. It just takes, it stages up, and by the time it gets to the very top of the column, it's, it's you know, almost pure alcohol. And all the water has gone to the bottom, 
it gets recycled, it goes up, and then more water is stripped out. So it's just, it's just completely cycles until there's no more water to get out of it, and, it's, and then we pull the alcohol off at the top. One design is the plate design, another design, and this, these, are, these are complicated, a little more complicated, they use them in industry more than anything else, but this is a, 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 a sieve tray, and they have these down tubes that feed, uh, feed the, the waste back down again to the next level and it drops down. Um, as I said, it's sort of complicated. Uh, bubble cap is a very similar design. They have little, little umbrellas over the tubes, so the vapors come up and they drop down, and then the water drops down. But the way we would do it, if, we're, if you're building it at home, be using these saddle packing. In that distillery column, you would have plates with holes in them, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't just let it go at that. You'd be putting these little, um, I don't have any, I, I should bring them out of the jar of them, but they're, they're very small little ceramic or stainless steel, um, well, they look like that. They're just little, little half saddles, and they allow the vapors to pass, pass them, and the water to drop past them. But they also have a lot of surface area to capture that uh, liquid and let it drop through while the alcohol goes up. So it's trying to get as much surface area into into a small enough unit because we need to let air in through the. We need to have a path for the for the vapors to travel through the packing so they can make their way to the top of the, of the column. This is a design that is used when you don't have a tall enough building. They just split the column in half, so you have two 12-foot columns or two 10-foot columns. It goes up one side uh, and comes out and then gets pumped down to the other side and then goes up again uh, the second column and then, then it gets harvested out the top. And again, these are, you know, these are a little more industrial, but that's uh, uh, they work very well. This is a home-built condenser. At the very top of the column, you, wanna, you want to, to sort of cold, hit that liquid with, with cold um, so that the alcohol drops out and it gets stored that way. So at the very top of the column, we have a condenser. And this is a homemade one. There's a lot of different designs, but this is very simple. Copper coils, uh, an inlet into a, into a small tube or into a chamber, and then uh, Cold water comes in, goes through the coil, and cold water comes out again. Uh, in that chamber, the alcohol comes through, hits the, hits the cold copper coils, and then just drops out, and we just let it drip out through a, through a uh, drain tube, which is at the bottom of the thing. It looks like a funnel. This was an old Mother Earth design from 1980, uh, with a wood-burning um, furnace under it, and, and the tank is there at the bottom, and then the, the distillation column goes up to the top, and you can see you know, see, it's, it's fairly tall, but you could split that column if you wanted to. This one folded so we could take it on the road. We, we put it on a trailer and then fold the, uh, the column down and then put it back up again when we were making alcohol at demonstrations. Uh, this is a small vacuum distillation. When you, uh, This is a very small tank. It's only about a 35, 40-gallon tank. Uh, this size of a, of a distillery could make uh, maybe motorcycle fuel, something like that. It probably wouldn't be enough for... Uh, a, a truck or anything, but it could it could be a, a good start towards a small vehicle or a motorcycle. Um, when you draw a vacuum on, when you when you actually suck the air out of the system, it actually lets you uh, it will boil water at a much lower temperature. So it's a big energy saver. Uh, we did a lot of experimentation with this. It it really hasn't been done that much out in the real world, but we have done a lot. And uh, my colleague at the time, Clarence Gosen, who lives in Oklahoma now, he. Uh, he has a lot of um, background and research in this, in the vacuum distillation. So we have, uh, uh, we never really published a lot about this, but, uh, but it, it was something we were working on, sort of on the side. It's a little more complicated. Um, this is that gentleman, the orchard owner from the very beginning of the talk. Uh, he actually did a little, a little solar experimental still. The little black stick that's on the front of that disc is a, is a miniature distillery, and he just gets a couple of a couple of pints of alcohol out of that, but it's totally from the sun, uh, as far as the heat goes. So it's, you know, it's a very low energy uh, device. Um, that's another Mother Earth um, distillation unit that was actually fired by a huge bank of mirrors, and you can see the reflection. That shiny square on the left side is, is, the, is the culmination of all the solar rays being directed on it, and it actually boils the mash in that, and the, that little tube on the top is the, uh, is the uh, tank, is the distillation column. 
So we'd make you know a few quarts of uh, a few quarts of alcohol from that device. Um, the next slide is a gentleman, uh, Mr. Rainey in South Carolina. He was kind enough to let me take a picture of him grinding up some sorghum down in the, in South Carolina, and he his family makes molasses, but they. It's, it's just one more step to making alcohol fuel. It's just that, that molasses is very, very rich in, sy in sugar syrup. So, you know, basically he was very familiar with what I was talking about. This is uh, North Carolina a and State University. They're growing cattails, making ethanol out of cattails, which is a, a better object because it's, uh, it's not a food, it's a, it's a, it's a cattail. So we, uh, we don't have to worry about the argument of food versus fuel and all, all that kind of thing. This chart is in the book, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here is just a, an idea of some of the different feedstocks. The point is, you're either gonna look at a feedstock with how much alcohol you can get per ton or per pound, or you're gonna look at it as to how much you can get per acre. And the best thing to do is look at it in both ways, because uh, you can see from the chart here, just, I just picked a few selected things. Uh, one of the best choices uh, on a weight basis is corn, and that's pretty much what almost probably 98% of the alcohol made in this country for for the uh, ethanol, what they put in gasoline, is made from corn, and that's not that's no uh, that's no uh, accident. That was because the corn lobby from Nebraska and Wisconsin and uh, all those corn states they really forced this through through Congress, and so that's why we have E10 fuel because they're you know, they're growing the corn. Um, but anyway, corn is, uh, by way, corn and rye are some of the better producers. Uh, sorghum cane is, isn't quite as good, but it's a good crop for us because it grows here very nicely. Corn is very debilitating to the soil. It takes a lot of water and it takes a lot of energy out of the soil, but uh, sorghum is not that way, so it's a good, it's a good choice. Um, sugar beets, sugar beets is nowhere near as good as sorghum, but I just wanted to show, the, you know, show some of the numbers up there. At, at uh, 21 gallons a ton, it does nowhere near corn's 84 gallons a ton. Um, on, a, on an acreage basis, sugar beets, uh, however, is one of the best there is uh, on a per acre basis. Uh, corn is also very good on a per acre basis, uh, 390 gallons per acre, and that figure is even that that figure is even a little older. I mean, they have they have now operational facilities that are getting uh, up, up pushing 500. Uh, and acres. It's all due to the strains of corn they're using, the hybrid corns they're using, and the uh, and the yeast they're using to, to squeeze every last drop of alcohol out of the process. Um, on a per acre basis, sorghum cane isn't one of the better ones, but it's it's, it's fair. So that's a you know it's just a, something to think about. And there's uh, in the book there's just loads of crops, and you can use you can use all sorts of things. This is a um, this is a just a real quick picture of the. Uh, this is one of the signs they put up to uh, in Brazil when they were introducing the alcohol to the to the public. What it's saying is don't pump. It's called hydrated alcohol because there's a little bit of water in it. Uh, it's very difficult to make perfectly pure 200 proof alcohol and keep it that way. It absorbs water, so even if you made pure alcohol and you put it in your car tank, in about a week, three or four days to a week, it would have absorbed about 2% water if not more. So it's, there's always going to be a little water in the tank, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Um, so they just call it hydrated alcohol because it has a little water in it. What that sign says is do not mix, do not mix with gasoline. This is, the, this is the alcohol fuel. Don't put it in with your gasoline fuel. And it says do not use in engines that are not modified for alcohol use. And when I was there, there was a, there was a, a whole cottage industry. They didn't have enough uh, the dealers could not produce the cars enough for the people to buy them. They couldn't keep up with the demand. So you'd have these guys on the, on the curb side, on street corners with a toolbox. And for 40 bucks, you left your car with him. He'd make the conversion. And when you came back from your work at lunch or whatever, you pick the car up. So these guys were lining cars up and making the alcohol conversions and, and parking the cars off so that their owners can pick them up later. Um, so this thing was this thing was really going. And they, they were it really it took a few years to make it work, but. Not only were they running alcohol in all the vehicles, the phone company, the electric company, were f when, when I was there, it was, a, it was a benevolent dictatorship, so there was no discussion about it. They just, the guy just got up, the, the, the premier, or his name was the, he was the, uh, you know, the president, El Presidente, you know, and he, he said, 
starting on this day, which is very near future, we're, we're going to be converting to alcohol. There's no questions about it. So to make that conversion easier, he let people see on the streets, they had big signs on the telephone trucks, you know, vehicle runs on alcohol. The, the, the phone company, the electric company, the army, the police, um, the city service workers, they all had alcohol vehicles. Those, those were the first ones. Um, and, um, and then all the bus service. Mercedes partnered with the government. Mercedes has a huge uh, operation in South America. Almost all the buses are Mercedes buses, so they were running the buses on, on uh, a pinon oil. A pinon sort of a pine cone. It's almost like a peanut, but it's a little pine cone. And they were manufacturing all their, uh, all their straight vegetable oil fuel out of this pinon nut. And, uh, and they had big signs on the buses, this truck runs on vegetable oil, or pinon oil. And so everybody would know that, and they'd, they'd know, they wouldn't, feel, um, they wouldn't feel leery about converting their own cars, because they, if they weren't using alcohol, they weren't going to drive a car. Uh, this is a Fiat Sienna. This is a, this is a 2008 model. It has a, uh, an Italian um, computer management company designed the computer for this, for Fiat. It has three fuels in the same car. You have one tank for compressed natural gas, one tank for alcohol, and one tank for gasoline. And the price varies, so every day when you go to the pump, it will tell you which one's cheaper. And so you can pump that one into the car. The car automatically reads the fuel and uses that fuel. So, and it even, it even like if you're going up a hill and you need a little extra power, it'll shoot a little more. If you're using gasoline and it needs a little more power, it'll zip a little alcohol in there. Or if you, want to, uh, it's on a level place, they'll switch over to compressed natural gas because that, that works well um, on a level surface. So it's, they did this in 2008, you know, why we're not doing it, you know, I don't know. So, but this is, these cars are available. Volkswagen has one, Fiat has one. I think Toyota may have one now too, but uh, that's what they use. And then, we used to do it. That's the carburetor of a, of a 1926, I think, 1926 Ford. Model T Ford, 1926, that rod is the adjuster because that engine ran on kerosene, alcohol, or gasoline, depending on what you had available. A lot of these vehicles were sold in farm country, way in the middle of nowhere, Nebraska and Minnesota, and places where you just didn't have a gas pump in every corner. And these people had kerosene, or they had, maybe they're making alcohol, so they could use it in the car. So that Henry Ford knew that, and he made his cars to be adjustable for a variety of fuels. That stopped in 1932, but you know they they did it. Um, this is a taxi cab we converted in 1979, I think, to uh, to alcohol fuel. We do some press releases and ran around the city of New York to show people that we could do that. Um, there's an airplane I converted when I was a young a young dog. Uh, ran that thing for the air show in Wisconsin uh, on alcohol. Um, and these are some of the engine conversion things. You can actually purchase a, uh, a fuel injection kit. If you have a carburetor, you can actually convert it to fuel injection and run it through the fuel injection uh, system, make it a little more efficient. Um, the carburetor needs to be, a, let me see if I have that in the picture. The carburetor needs to be adjusted. Uh, basically, we're enlarging in a carburetor, which hardly anybody uses anymore, but, but they actually work very well with alcohol. You're adjusting the, um, the main jet in the carburetor, you're, you're enlarging it by anywhere from 35 to 40 percent in volume, not in, not in just a, um, uh, your, your, the, this drill size is you actually put a, take the hole in there and drill a very, very small hole into the existing hole there, just enlarge it by a small amount. And again, the, the, I have a chart in the book that shows you the tables of how big to go. Um, but you're enlarging that jet by about 35 percent and the idle adjustment jet is, is usually adjusted that way, so it allows a little more fuel in. The reason for that is that gas does not have any oxygen in it, but alcohol does have oxygen, so you need to have more fuel to go through it to equal the original power of the gasoline in it. So it's, um, it's uh, sort of hit and miss, but, but the chart will show you how to, how to get very close. Fuel injection engines have a little computer that tells you that that reads the mixture and adjusts it accordingly, um, there is a device you can purchase that will actually fool the fuel injector into staying open a little longer so it lets more fuel in. And, uh, and that, that's what they do in 
in Brazil for their conversions. We actually have it available here, but it doesn't work all that well. Uh, because it was reverse engineered, it's a patent protected device and it was reverse engineered from the Brazilian model, so they didn't really get it right. Um, and it's probably illegal too, because it really wasn't, it's not really a patented uh, device. Rather than do that, the best way to convert a gasoline fuel injected engine is to, to purchase the next larger size fuel injector. It'll fit in the same hole, but it lets more, more fuel go through. Um, or if you're a real whiz with microchips, you can actually manufacture, remanufacture the chip sequence in the, in the computer so it will allow the fuel injector to stay open a little longer and that'll work out. But that, that's, that's getting to sort of highly technical stuff. This is another thing we do when you do a conversion on a gasoline engine. It's, it, there's two things you want to do is you want to preheat the fuel a little bit. Preheat the alcohol fuel up to about 170 degrees and you want to preheat the air entering the air system. Uh, many modern engines already have that, but, um, but in an older car with a carburetor, you want to preheat that, that, that air coming in by running an inlet tube alongside the exhaust manifold so it, hits, it sucks the heat out of the exhaust uh, manifold and then warms the air in the process. That's a company in Canada manufacturing cellulose, a wood-based alcohol fuel. It's called Iogen, that's one of the top manufacturers at this point. Another way to do it is to have one car have a dual fuel carburetor system on, a, on an engine, so you actually have it, it's either running on gasoline or running on alcohol. You can start on gasoline and switch over to alcohol. Um, or you can run it on gasoline, uh, or run it on alcohol until you no longer have alcohol available, and then you can switch back over to gasoline, because we don't have ethanol stations around here you know, to just load up with alcohol, you have, to, you have to have a supply of it. The food versus fuel discussion, that's something that has always come up, and, I, and I've just sort of put this together so people can understand. About three, in, in 2011, about 3%, just 3% of the world's, the entire world's supply of grain was used to manufacture ethanol. So that's not, I mean, it's a lot of grain, but it's not a lot in the big picture. Um, and uh, this, this other point here, about 11 and a half cents of every, re of every retail dollar pays for the farm value of the agricultural ingredients. So the rest of it is, pay is, is paying for the energy and the packaging and the production and all that other thing. So that's a, a, good, a good way to look at, look at where the money's going uh, as, far as, uh, as far as the food value versus you know, the other part of it. Um, Food prices really, you know, people say, oh, the price of tacos went up or corn chips or whatever. First of all, we're not eating. The corn we grow for alcohol fuel is dent corn. Anybody in the cattle business, dent corn is what they feed cows. It's not the consumable, it's not the kind of corn we eat. It's a, it's a lower grade, it's a high starch. It's not a sweet corn like we eat. Um, and um, so when, when all the ethanol was being used to put into, make 10% uh, uh, ethanol fuel at the gas pump, people were saying you're taking, you're rising, raising the price of our food product. That's not what's happening. What's rising, raising the price of food product is the cost of fuel because it costs, uh, it, it takes gasoline and diesel fuel and everything to raise, you know, to grow the corn, to, to ship it, to, to, to do everything you have to do with, with gasoline and food. It's not, it's not particularly uh, the, the uh, use of the corn is driving the price up. And the other thing is, it's not the, it's not the kind of corn we eat anyway. That's the second point. And the third point is uh, that when you manufacture alcohol, all that's being used out of the, out of this whole product is just the starch. The protein doesn't get affected. The protein stays as protein. That's that's the food part. The starch is being converted to sugar, and that turns into alcohol. But the protein gets saved and sold back to the farmer for a feed supplement. So he, the farmer can mix it into uh, his cattle feed. And it's a very high protein good. It's a very valuable product. So we're not stealing the food out of the corn when we make alcohol. We're, we're only taking the starch out. The protein stays with the cycle and then it gets returned back to the animal. Um, so uh, the, the last point here, the ethanol plants produce both fuel and feed. One bushel of corn, or 56, 56 pounds of corn, yields uh, almost three gallons of fuel grade ethanol and 17 pounds of animal feed. Those numbers are even higher in some circles because 
the technology has gotten better and better. Every year it gets more efficient. So, you know, these, these figures are a little bit old, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it is, there's, we're not stealing food and making, and making uh, uh, alcohol, especially if, we're, especially if we're looking at other crops that are non-food crops. In 1978, just to just talk about efficiency, in 1978, one acre of corn would give us about 240 gallons of ethanol. Now, in 2009, due to uh, corn, corn um, uh, quality increase and just the whole process, uh, we're getting about 480 gallons out of, uh, out of the same acre. So we've really, really come a long way since 19, the late 70s. Um, so the average acre of corn now at the, in, the, in the corn producing uh, sectors of the country is, is, is over 500 gallons of, of ethanol. And uh, the ethanol plants run and they slow down, they speed up, it, it, it's all market driven. So they shut some down and they crank some others up and they, and they determine if they need to ship, how far they have to ship. If, if they have to ship too far, they won't, they'll shut this one down and they'll open. The, the other one off where it needs to be, so they can only ship it so far. Um, um, you may have heard that part of the delivery system, a lot of the delivery gets done on trains, and um, and some of the ethanol delivery is being delayed now because natural gas is being shipped on trains. So it's like we're fighting for the trains now. But essentially, most of the alcohol we use today is being put into gasoline as 10% mix. And the federal government is on the program now where we're going to be using 15% in the, uh, in the gasoline we buy. And the cars made after 2009 are equipped to handle that. Um, but what I'm talking about here is not even, not even mixing gasoline with, with alcohol at all. We're just talking about straight alcohol fuel because that's really the cleanest and most cost-effective way to do it. We, we as individuals can't make alcohol pure enough in a cost-effective way to be able to mix it with gasoline. It has to be a lot purer than we can probably do that without spending a lot of investment money. So we're gonna be happy with making it uh, at 190 proof, which we can very easily do, and run in the engine just fine with a, with a little bit of water. And that, that, that's, you know, that's good. It will run better in a carbureted car with water than it does in a fuel-injected car, but they will still both run you know, reasonably well. Let me see. It just, Basically, just some uh, just some focus on how those figures. Just some focus on how the um, how efficient the industry, alcohol industry, has gotten in manufacturing alcohol over the years. Uh, we use less water, less energy, um, and we're we're getting more yield per bushel of corn. So it's all good. So far, so good. Um, that stuff's not that critical. And these are E15 and E10 stuff, which I don't, don't really need to get into. I'll just leave it up there. Is there any, any particular questions or any area you want me to, to highlight a little more about? Um, I sometimes have particular questions. Uh, if anybody has anything, yeah. There shouldn't really be any, in the long term, what's gonna happen with the fuel injected vehicle is that the injectors will probably have to be replaced. Uh, this is years down the road, and they may not have to be replaced if you're using gasoline. That's about the, that's about the worst thing that could happen. Um, in certain vehicles, especially older ones, the fuel tanks and the fuel lines were not made to handle alcohol. So the, the best solution there is really just to, to get a newer vehicle that uh, is set up. Because from 1975, uh, the manufacturers were instructed by the federal government to start making their vehicles alcohol friendly. And they're supposed to be doing it you know, right now. I mean, even new cars, they're, they're all ready to go. It's just they don't, they don't use it. A lot of the simple, uh, cost-effective stuff is based on the 80s stuff because that's what's the cheapest to build. But I also go into, especially in the area of enzymes, uh, feedstock information, and uh, the vehicles have, have stepped into the modern times here, so into current times, so we, we're talking about vehicles. Uh, the book was published in 2009, so you know, it's, that, it's that new. Any other questions? Yeah. The question is, is there an alcohol injector? Uh, no, they do make special injectors for the race cars, and I don't know if you could buy one or not, but, but the regular gasoline injector is made of material that is perfectly suitable for alcohol. Would it just be higher volume? You have to go up to the next step, yeah. You have to, you have to step up to the next... Um, bigger injectors for turbo cars. Yeah, step up yeah. to the next one. What about turbo?
Turbo, turbo charger. Okay, I, I didn't really get into that discussion. This is a whole big discussion. Some, sometimes I talk about just engines. When engines are optimized for alcohol fuel, they are far more effective than gasoline as, as far as power and uh, efficiency. To do that, we have to increase the compression ratio up to levels that are near diesel levels, and it's not practical for gasoline engines to do that. Some people have actually taken diesel engines and converted them back to gasoline because they're made to take the, the stress of that high compression. When we can run an engine at fi about 15, 16 to 1 compression ratio, that alcohol, which has a, which has a uh, octane rating of 106 plus, really becomes an effective fuel. We need to change the starter motor so it can start the, turn the engine over. We need to make sure the um, connecting rods and the crankshaft and all that are, are, are forged so, like a diesel engine so they can take the pressure. And uh, there's some other minor modifications, but when we do that, the mileage and the power is extremely uh, improved. Uh, we had a we had a um, a 86 Ford uh, F-150 truck with a 302 cubic inch V8, um, which had normally a 8.2 compression ratio, uh, and we in the shop we knocked it up to uh, 13 and a half to one, and I towed the alcohol trailer behind me going to Tennessee. Um, pure alcohol, where the gasoline truck towing the other still could was really struggling to go up the hills. You know, I just I had no no issue at all. His question was basically about turbochargers and superchargers. That's another way of increasing compression by forcing the air in uh, into the combustion chamber in a in a sort of a air pressure method, and it will work just fine with that. That's actually an easier way to do it than than fooling around with uh, with rebuilding the engine because it's only for short bursts. Yeah. It, yeah, alcohol runs cooler, so it uh, actually uh, increases increases the longevity of the engine, but also uh, takes away the critical issues of overheating when you when you um, accelerate. The engine doesn't knock because it's cooler, and the alcohol has such a high octane rating. So essentially, a turbo charged vehicle, the turbo is getting hot from the exhaust. Right. So it's also creating intake pressure on the other end. Right. And it's running through an intercooler to bring it back to ambient. Right, right. So if it's already cooler, it should be that much more effective. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We, he, it's, it's, what he said was sort of technical. It's, uh, the turbocharger has to, has to uh, go through a cooler with alcohol. We don't have to worry about that step because it's already, it's already running cooler. Yeah, yeah the, book, the book does include several, several different designs for still plans in there. Three-inch column still and some other other um, other designs. Gas mileage. If if you do not modify the engine with the compression ratio, you're going to drop mileage. There's no question about it because alcohol has air in it, and you you can't burn. I mean, air doesn't burn. So so you're going to use more liquid to to get the same number of miles out of the out of the fuel. However, if you would invest in a, either a supercharger, a turbocharger, or or the expense of um, of change in compression ratio, which is which people do in the hot rod circles all the time, that fuel mileage will come right equal to or better than normal mileage. And in fact, with some of the tests that Ford did, they actually improved mileage by almost five percent. So, on certain certain vehicles. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, any other questions? The question was, what about conversion of chainsaws and two cycle engines, small engines? It a small engine is a lot more. Um, uh, open to damage if you don't use the proper lubricants. A two-cycle engine needs a, needs a synthetic oil when you're burning alcohol in it, and if certain manufacturers don't, don't use the right kind of seals in, um, like in uh, four-cycle engines, they may not use the correct seals so the alcohol can eat away at the seals, but you can get nitrile or uh, there's other types of materials that actually uh, are not damaged by alcohol. You can replace carburetor parts with the correct alcohol friendly carburetor parts and it will be okay. In a two cycle engine you need absolutely need to use a synthetic oil, not the not the conventional oil. And that'll that'll be okay too. And you can make those adjustments on the carburetor without rejetting. The synthetic oils will mix will mix with the little bit of water and the oil in it. it you may have some periods of um, uh, performance change if there's water in it, but it's not going to really be a damaging issue. It's just going to be an RPM change. 
Uh, but if you use a regular oil, it won't, it'll, it won't mix with the water in there very well. It has to be a synthetic oil. Yeah. Yeah, the, the gentleman has a Toyota um, that he puts um, E85 in, which is 85% alcohol, puts about 30 or 40% in there, and he has never had any trouble doing that. I wouldn't say I recommended it, but if it works, you can do it. The, the only issue, is, immediate issue, is the warranty. If, if, if it was discovered that you had done that and there was an issue. He's got 309,000 miles. Okay, at 309,000 miles, we're not worried about the warranty. <laughs> question was what about the stability of marine boat gas that now we're into discussion about gasoline that's that is a problem when when you have the solution for your for your um, e10 fuel when you use it in a marine a marine engine like that is to not store it in the tank change that fuel out as frequently as you can manage to and you won't have trouble with it all the trouble with the marine engines is, is essentially because people leave it sit in the tank and it, it just it just breaks down and it uh, sucks water in there and it really uh, is a problem. It hurts the aluminum. And the gentleman made a good point. He said, I wish, I, I wish they would have told us that before they started putting the alcohol in. And the, that's the worst, the marine industry is the worst hit. That's, that's the one that really has been affected by the alcohol and the fuel. Everybody else is not as much of a problem with the, anything near the water, the salt water, the water itself is really an issue. Um, and some chainsaws have been a real issue too, but people don't, they, they need to be changing that fuel out or removing the fuel from the engine when they're not using it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.